Welcome. I'm Ryan Merkley, a Director with Aspen Digital. Thank you for joining us. This session is a part of a series that, of briefings that we're doing on mis- and disinformation hosted by the Aspen Institute in tandem with our Commission on Information Disorder. My colleagues and I are talking to top experts in the field to make sense of the many, many facets of this information crisis. These are designed as a resource both for our commissioners, but also for the broader public. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Brendan Nyan. Uh, he's a political scientist and a professor of government at Dartmouth College. Some of his recent work uh, examines the effects of countermeasures like fact checks and what they can do in the retention of misper misperceptions and on the spread of misinformation that can follow. We're going to talk to him about that, but we're also going to talk a little bit about the last couple of US elections, about platforms and the YouTube algorithms. So let's jump in. Welcome, Brendan. I'm looking forward to speaking with you. My pleasure. Great to be here. So let me give you the big, broad question first, and then we'll, we'll dive in uh, to the details. Every day, people choose to believe and share things that are demonstrably false. Why do we do that? What is wrong with us? Well, we're human beings. I guess I would start there. Um, I think it's very important in this space to establish that there was no golden era of truth in the past that has somehow been lost, that misinformation has always been with us, conspiracy theories have always been with us, both historically and around the world. Um, you know, when it comes to us as at the individual level, we have limitations in memory and cognition, right? Sometimes we um, simply don't remember things accurately. We've heard things and we think maybe they're true and we haven't checked them out. And in other cases, we're endorsing claims we've heard that resonate with our preconceptions about the world. Um, in the contemporary United States, we're especially worried often about the role played by partisanship. We may be more vulnerable to misinformation that seems to resonate with uh, the party that we favor um, and especially misinformation that tells us something bad about the other side. Um, that's a kind of key point of vulnerability. And it's possible for that kind of partisan misinformation to be worse, even if misinformation itself is not a new phenomenon. I want to take you uh, into that in, in more detail. So let's let's dive into some of the pieces here. Um, you've worked in the space for some time. Um, and uh, there was a recent piece in the New York Times that uh, cited some of your work. And it, it talked about how um, your research suggests that our relationships, that kind of a desire to fit in, the New York Times called it belonging, um, influences our willingness to share or promote things that we know to be false. Can you explain a bit about your research that, that helped them draw that assertion and, and why we do that or why you think that we do that? Yeah, so I haven't studied that phenomenon specifically. Um, the author, Max Fisher, I think was drawing from his own background in the field. But the idea is that we're social creatures, that when we um, think about the opinions we hold or even the beliefs we express, um, we care about what other people think about us. And we're sensitive to the views that they hold and how they perceive us. Um, and what, you know, of course, what we say about politics and other controversial issues right, can be very sensitive in certain contexts. So it's, it's natural that people may care a lot about what people in their group say. So it may be the case that, for instance, um, there's a social pressure to hold a particular view, even, even if it's false. It may be that you've heard that view from a lot of other people in your in-group who you trust more, right? Who you think, um, our credible source of information or who share your interests. Um, and for that reason, you might come to hold that view um, that's common within your group. So there's lots of ways in which it's not just misinformation being out there in the world, but it's the people actually we're closest to who can be the most powerful vectors of, of, of misinformation, either through that kind of direct transmission or just in that sense of what the group with which you identify the things that they believe and the, the attitudes they express. Yeah, I want to. Um, earlier, you talked about partisanship, and I think there's a there is a, a sense of belonging and being you know a part of that group of of being partisan. Um, and um, maybe I'll take you to some more research that um, you did in the past, and where you coined the term the backfire effect. And you've also done some research more recently that updated your thinking a little bit about that. Um, I want to give you a chance to talk to us about. What is the backfire effect? And, and how have you refined your understanding of it over the past decade and in the work that you've done? 
Yeah, this is uh, hopefully an important corrective. So I believe in corrective information. So I want to offer one here. Um, my co-author Jason Rifler and I, the first research we did in this field was an experiment where we randomly exposed people to news articles that either included or did not include corrective information. Um, uh, so there was some claim made by a high profile public figure. And in the context of the article, it was either debunked or not. And then after people read that article, we asked them whether they agreed or disagreed with the claim in question. In our original study, two of the five experiments we conducted um, generated what we called a backfire effect in which the ideological group that was most vulnerable to the claim being made um, expressed more agreement with the false claim when they read the version of the article that included the corrective information. Um, it's a very discouraging finding and it's one the world mm. seized on as a kind of explanation of why misinformation is so uh, difficult to debunk. Um, but there is good news. Um, science proceeds and in the years following that, a number of other researchers and my own uh, co-authors and I also have found that that kind of reaction is very much the exception and not the norm. Um, the general finding in this field, as we've done more and more scientific studies, that when you show people corrective information or when you show them fact checks, it tends to move people in the direction of the information you've provided. It tends, in other words, to reduce misperceptions if you're showing them accurate information. So the backfire effect seems to be quite rare. It is the case sometimes it's harder to get people to update their views um, when that uh, corrective information is uh, counter attitudinal. When it's inconsistent with what they'd like to be true. Maybe they don't update as much as we would hope. Um, but the tendency is for people to move in the direction of, of, of uh, the information they've been given. That's good news. It means we should continue to do things like fact check, report accurate information, provide it to people, et cetera. In general, it seems to be effective, at least when we do these kinds of experiments. The question I think for everyone though to consider is why that isn't enough, right? Why that isn't enough to drive out the kinds of misperceptions we've seen linger for so many years in the face of repeated constant fact checking. And that's something I think we need to explore more. Yeah. I mean, in your, in your updated paper, um, you talk about a, a kind of matrix of influences and areas for further exploration. And, and I want to dig into some of those. You talked about um, false statements and endorsements from elites. You talk about debunking and fact checking from others and about social media amplification and the ways that these sort of things uh, can create the conditions for misperceptions to persist. So let's let's maybe go through each of those uh, in turn and talk a little bit about some of the the things that you've been thinking about and the and perhaps some of the discoveries or the or the insights that you've started to draw as you've have explored these uh, these areas and the around misperceptions and the persistence of beliefs in the face of, of um, countervailing facts. So maybe we'll start with um, the role of elites uh, and the media. Earlier, a few moments ago, you talked about you know your allegiance to someone you trust, and I think elites can sometimes uh, be that as well. You wrote, um, quote, ultimately, however, the best approach is to disrupt the formation of linkages between group identities and false claims and to reduce the flow of cues, reinforcing those claims from elites and the media. Can you maybe say a little bit more about your thinking here and how to actually put it in practice? Like what are some of the ways that we might counter influence, counter their influence or ways that we might curb their behavior? I'm interested in your thinking around that. Yeah, I think this is a, a, a critical issue. Um, when, you, when people think about misperceptions, it's easy to focus in on the cases where misperceptions are the worst. So, you know, people may have different issues that come to mind. It's often the case, though, that those most politicized, controversial, factual issues are ones where elites have popularized misconceptions. It's very rare that these things totally come from the bottom up. It's often the case that if elites have promoted and popularized these misconceptions and driven them ultimately into the minds of the public. Right? So that's what we see with climate change, for instance, where um, if you look back in the public opinion data um, from the mid 1990s, before that issue became so politicized, you see Republicans and Democrats actually looking very similar, Republicans expressing significant concern about it. It's only as that flow of elite messages builds over time and the parties sort out on that issue that people really start to pull apart. Um, and we, we see even in later years that the people who are most politically interested and knowledgeable are the most polarized. They're reflecting the cues that they're being given 
by their party, by the elites in their party. So that tells us something important. Um, mm -hmm. the, the first thing it tells us is we need to be attentive to when this kind of politicization of factual issues happens in the first place, because the best outcome is to prevent it from happening at all. We've seen how hard it is to unwind the politicization of climate science or how hard it is to change people's views of the legitimacy of the 2020 election. Um, it's not to say we should give up in those cases, but it's just it would be better to prevent those issues from being politicized in the first place when it comes to the matters of fact. Of course, we can disagree about what to do about those issues. That's politics. We should disagree about how to address climate change. Um, the, the problem is when the underlying facts themselves become politicized. So the first, the first takeaway from that discussion is just to think about incipient politicization of factual issues and how we can prevent it. And I think the mm -hmm. best approach in our that we have, however imperfect, is to increase the political costs and decrease the political benefits of popularizing and promoting misinformation. Um, we need to discourage politicians from making false claims. We need to increase the sanctions against them informally through civil society, through the kind of reputational damage that they suffer when they make false claims. Now, that may sound naive. We just had a president in the United States who um, rode the birther myth in part to the White House and made more than 20,000 false claims in office. So this is obviously not uh, perfect, but it is the best tool we have. Politicians are quite sensitive to how they were they are covered. Even Donald Trump, for all those false things, false things he said, was incredibly concerned about how he was portrayed in the media. Um, so if we can do better at increasing those costs for politicians who make these kinds of claims, it hopefully can in turn dissuade them from promoting those false claims that have already been popularized and starting those new issues from being politicized in the way I was warning about. And so one, one, one last point on this. Yeah. Uh, Rifler and I did a study where we actually randomly sent letters to state legislators in the United States, reminding them of the threat of being fact-checked by a PolitiFact affiliate in their state. And that reminder of the threat of fact-checking seemed to induce them to be more careful in their public statements. So that's at least a way to get at this mechanism that I'm proposing. Um, right now, the incentives are totally out of balance. Of course, if you generate controversy by saying false things, you're on TV more, not less, right? You're raising more money from small donors, not less, right? And, and we have to rebalance that. People have talked, for instance, about not hosting um, members of Congress on TV who deny the legitimacy of the 2020 election. I think that's an appropriate example of the kind of step we might think about if we're trying to discourage this kind of behavior. Yeah, certainly the there's a group who have learned and I would say even adopted this as core tactic, which is that the that that using disinformation as a tactic is one that works and that there will be aided and abetted by the media. We didn't talk as much about the media in this section, but I, I think there is a there is a a loop or a cycle that comes from that of the the elites that speak and the media that amplify and and share that around what what would be the kinds of consequence or or um incentive or disincentives that you you've been thinking about around the media side of this you've certainly spoken to the to the elite side i wonder if you've had thoughts about what we might do in the media side of that equation so uh, negative coverage is the mm -hmm. the kind of currency of the realm here and again it's not all powerful um it didn't dissuade trump but maybe mm -hmm. he would have uh, made even more false statements on the margin um, if he hadn't been fact-checked so aggressively. Um, and I think many other politicians are far more sensitive to those kinds of um, considerations. Um, you know, access to airtime, uh, you know, uh, during Trump's presidency, some uh, shows stopped having Kellyanne Conway on the air at all because she would um, refuse to engage with questions and filibuster and make repeated false statements in a way that made uh, the conversation entirely unproductive. Um, you know, there are other things you can do. I mean, hopefully people will lose primaries, right? That's, that's mm -hmm. another way that um, this stuff can matter on the margin. It's hard to change uh, behavior in general elections because we are so polarized, right? On the margin, there are relatively few persuadable voters. They do exist. So their death is often uh, overstated. People do mm -hmm. change their mind election to election and political scientists have continued to find that despite the polarization we observe. But the effects are small. 
And there's lots of ways upstream we could make these things matter more too um, uh, in, in how candidates are selected and promoted um, within parties, the roles are given um, in legislatures and so forth. Again, I have no magic bullets, no one else does mm -hmm. either. Um, and importantly, we, you know, it's, we should make clear, the goal isn't to get rid of misinformation. Misinformation is inherent to living in a free society. Um, that should not be the goal, but we should think about a kind of harm reduction approach that we've gotten out mm -hmm. of, um, you know, the boundaries of kind of normal political discourse into a point where um, our political system is highly vulnerable to a kind of particularly toxic misinformation. And, and, and again, not just any misinformation, but let me just highlight one, one reason we should care about this. It's that it's increasingly being wielded um, on topics where the stakes are high for all of us. It's not simply that the other candidate is bad, right? Now it's misinformation being wielded against the legitimacy of the results of a democratic election or is misinformation being wielded against the public health response to a global pandemic. Yeah. The stakes are incredibly high in those situations. And I think yeah. demand um, a, you know, a stronger response than simple misinformation of you know, smearing the other side, which is regrettable, but again, is, is, is a kind of price of living in, the free, in a free society and not something we should assume um, you know, one can or should get rid of entirely. Yeah. Um, I, I want to talk about fact checking um, as one of those ways of mitigating the harm or uh, of reducing the harm. You talked about harm reduction. Um, you know, you've talked about the role of fact checking and also how it may have failed, whether it was uh, had sufficient reach or whether uh, cognition was an issue amongst those who were receiving those fact checks, whether they really understood what they were hearing um, and how it might be more effective. I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about how fact checking can break through uh, those partisan allegiances, that sense of belonging, the cognition challenges, the reach. What, what are some of the, the ways in which we might use fact checking to address some of those misperceptions and, and pervasive misinformation? Yes, I, I think fact checking is, is a promising approach. It's not a silver bullet. And in some ways, I worry people have oversold it, right? We don't expect um, firefighters to eliminate the possibility of fire, and we shouldn't expect fact checkers to eliminate the possibility of misinformation. Um, I think they've been effective in a number of ways. Um, for people who seek them out, they're a very useful informational resource. Most people don't seek them out. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so we need to think about all the different ways they can affect our political debate, right? So one way they can help is by providing that information to people who, who um, you know, again, go somehow find it. Um, in a lot of cases, that's not going to be well targeted to the people who need the fact check the most, right? So in our research, for instance, before the 2016 election, we found that um, in the set of cases where we observed in web browsing behavior, people viewing an article from an untrustworthy website that had been fact checked, um, fewer than 3% of them actually saw the corresponding fact check. Um, in general, the people who went to untrustworthy websites, fewer than half went to any of the major fact checking websites at all in that period. So there's a kind of mismatch problem here mm -hmm. that we should keep in mind. The average person is not following political news very closely and that applies uh, in particular to fact checking news, which are kind of niche political content for people who follow the news closely. Um, mm -hmm. um, but they can still be helpful for those folks and there's lots of people who get a lot of value out of them. Um, They've also been effective in how they've influenced journalism more generally. Many more people get news from um, mainstream sources than they do from fact checkers directly. And the fact checkers have um, their conclusions are being brought in to um, reporting that's then being disseminated to much wider audiences. Um, and their style has influenced the practices of journalists who increasingly have moved away from the kind of he said, she said reporting that often put false information on an equal footing with true information. In the era mm -hmm. of fact checking, that style has become um, seen as a real mistake, as a real journalistic failure. And I think the fact checkers have played a key role in that. And then the third factor is the one I talked about earlier, that fact checkers may help dissuade politicians from making false claims at least on, on the margin. So in all of those ways, I think they can be, they can be helpful, um, but they're absolutely not uh, a panacea. 
Um, people may not be especially welcoming of fact-checking information that um, tells them that their side is wrong. Um, and um, you know, despite those encouraging results I told you about earlier, um, you know, we still certainly see lots of evidence of that anecdotally. Every time I hear fact checker, I think of Daniel Dale, uh, who uh, he and I were contemporaries at City Hall in Toronto many years ago, and he's obviously gone on to to be the one that probably checked every one of those twenty thousand uh, false statements that uh, President Trump made. And I and I think about how um, those incentives are there. And also the mainstream media largely didn't use the word lie in reference to the president's statements until his last months in office. And, you know, those that, that something switched only in that point, that that fact checking was both useful and also, you know, didn't break through. And so it's, I think, as you said, like, it's not going to eliminate the possibility of fire, um, but it may reduce its spread as others come to see it as part of the broader story. So we've talked, we're sort of taking the, the funnel approach. We've talked about the top of the funnel where, you know, statements are made or original articles are written that then turn into other follow-on articles. So the media, we talked about fact-checking and it's sort of mitigating uh, potential uh, against those things as they make their way out into the world. And now I want to talk about social media as the amplifier uh, and the extender of, of reach in those. Um, you did a study of YouTube's recommendation engine and its role in uh, helping users find their way to extremist content. Uh, and the report said that while the YouTube algorithm does deliver extremist content, it doesn't tend to do it unless you're sort of already looking for it. That's counter to a lot of the claims and sort of kind of uh, general wisdom that we hear that people argue that, you know, you could just be watching cat videos on YouTube and suddenly be drawn into Nazi propaganda. You've also more recently looked at newsfeed algorithms and the role that they play. So I want to give you a chance to talk about your research around uh, various implications of algorithms and social media in the broader information disorder problem. And I'm curious whether you think the role of algorithms is overblown in that, uh, in that story. Yeah, this is a big question. Um, and I'll just say it's a hard one to evaluate from the outside because no, um, no one outside of the big platform companies can know exactly what their algorithms are doing. Um, and even those companies themselves do not fully understand why the algorithms are doing what they are doing. So for all those reasons, there's a kind of, um, these results are, 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 you know, that I'm gonna describe to you are somewhat provisional. Um, they're also subject to change because those companies are changing how their platforms work all the time. Um, with that said, um, do I think uh, the effects of algorithms are often overstated. Yes, uh, I absolutely do. I think many people have uh, blamed algorithms for all sorts of um, pathologies in our politics um, uh, for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. Just like uh, the similar to the way people rush to blame so-called fake news for Trump's uh, victory after 2016. Um, people are looking for simple answers to complex problems. Um, you know, uh, uh, polarization has been rising for decades. Um, social media did not create it. Social media algorithms did not create it. Um, these are pro far more sophisticated problems. But that said, there are real concerns about the algorithms and how they operate. So we have to be able to hold, we have to be able to hold both those ideas in our heads at the same time. That the algorithms are instantiating um, mm -hmm. um, a set of choices in what is being shown to people that matter, and we should know what they're doing and how it's affecting what people are seeing about politics. Um, we should also uh, calibrate the, our understanding of those effects by saying they're likely to be much smaller than people anticipate. Um, so uh, let me talk about these, these two uh, examples that you mentioned. Um, Great, thank you. The first one is, is, is with a group of co-authors um, examining um, how we might make algorithms um, uh, better promote information that is credible. So one concern people have is that in, um, engagement drives algorithmic prioritization. What you see in your newsfeed is in part a function of what the algorithm thinks you'll be most interested in. The concern many people have is that engagement often rewards socially undesirable kinds of content, misinformation, 
highly polarizing content, attacks on other people, et cetera, right? There's lots of kinds of content that thrive in that ecosystem that we might not want to reward. Um, and so what my, what my co-authors and I uh, tested is an approach where even if you didn't have a strong signal on the source of a particular piece of content on its trustworthiness, you could um, look at the partisan diversity of its audience as a kind of cue about its likely quality, that um, diverse partisan audiences were often associated with more trustworthy content. And conversely, the kinds of um, socially undesirable content I described before may in some cases um, be heavily weighted in terms of who's engaging with it and sharing it and so forth towards one party or the or the other. Um, so that's that's one way of where we could we could we need to be thinking about how to rework algorithms to promote um, uh, you know more socially desirable content. Now the platforms have made a number of changes in this direction um, as they've come under greater scrutiny since 2016. Um, you know, there's lots of kinds of quick baby stuff that once arrived on Facebook, which is receded, for instance. Um, they're now prioritizing people in your life and what they do more than they have in the past relative to news. It actually was a, a shock to websites that had built their um, uh, monetization strategies around Facebook traffic. Um, right. So uh, it's, not, it's not all engagement driven, um, but uh, nonetheless, we want to create positive incentives. So this goes back, back to this idea about incentives I was describing earlier with politicians. We want a news and information ecosystem that rewards quality um, and that limits spread of false and dubious information. And, and to the extent that algorithms are helping that kind of information to spread um, and helping to amplify it, um, that's a problem. Um, so that's the, the first study. The second study you mentioned is a study my co-authors and I did um, that was sponsored by the Anti-Defamation League, um, although we alone are responsible for its contents, looking at YouTube. Mm -hmm. And uh, YouTube gets much less scrutiny than Twitter and Facebook, and I think that's a mistake. Um, I would certainly encourage the commission um, and anyone concerned about this issue to give them um, uh, equal uh, scrutiny, uh, if not more, um, given the just sheer number of hours people spend watching YouTube and the kind of uh, impact of the video medium, um, which is potentially significant, given we know about how humans are responsible to responsive to uh, other human beings, right? You have a big face talking to you on a screen. People develop these, what are called parasocial relationships with the people they're watching on videos. Um, YouTube is quite important and somehow receives less scrutiny than a lot of other uh, platforms. Um, in this uh, research, we recruited a large national sample of Americans to install a browser extension that let us see, with their permission, what videos they were watching or had watched recently on YouTube, um, and that allowed us to do something that wasn't that isn't possible with what you can see on the site itself. Many researchers have used what you can see on the site and what's called the API that's publicly available from YouTube to um, look at things like the number of views, the number of comments, the author of the uh, you know of the video, etc., the creator of the video. Um, what we were able to do, though, is not just say, you know, this is, you know, which videos are getting so many views and who posts them, but actually see who on the audience side is seeing them. And be, we combined this digital behavioral data we collected with survey data, and that allowed us to say who in particular is watching these and how do they get there. And this comes back to finally, ultimately, to your question, Ryan, about algorithms. Um, the concern people have about YouTube is that the algorithm is especially powerful there. The watch next feature of YouTube uh, drives a huge amount of their watch time. Um, and they've gotten very good at recommending videos people will click on and keeping them on site. Um, they'll even autoplay the next video when you get to the end of your current video. The concern people had, as you described, is that people uh, in that context may be uh, pulled down the so-called rabbit hole and exposed to extremist content that they wouldn't have otherwise sought out. Hmm. Um, our data don't allow us to um, look at the period before a series of changes that Google made um, uh, up through 2019. So our data are 2020 and after. So this is after okay. the number of changes Google uh, has made to YouTube. But um, what we find in that period, at least, is um, the folks consuming um, a lot of extremist content on YouTube 
are people who already had high levels of racial resentment um, as measured by a standard survey measure to begin with. Um, and the algorithm, when we look at what's being recommended to people, we find um, that these kinds of uh, extremist videos that we're concerned about are almost never recommended on um, content that is uh, not of concern, that's not potentially harmful. Um, but when we have, we, we've used these lists of videos of, sorry, of channels that have been identified by subject matter experts and scholars as either we categorize them as either alternative channels that are kind of potential gateways to harmful content or fully extremist channels. And we mm -hmm. find the recommendations to those kinds of potentially harmful content appear um, largely on other videos of those categories. So when you are watching an alternative video, you are, you know, almost nearly half the recommendations you get are to alternative or extremist videos. When you're watching an extremist uh, channel, nearly half the recommendations you're getting are to alternative and extremist channels, right? So when you're in that context, these recommendations are still being surfaced, even if they're um, rarely being offered on uh, videos that don't fall into either category. So mm -hmm. um, what that highlights is that there's a, a kind of smallish minority of people who are finding and connecting to potentially harmful content on social media platforms. It's a very different threat model in the, uh, you know, in the, in the computer science jargon than, um, you know, the average person watching a kitten video and falling down the radicalization rabbit hole, right? Um, right. Again, it's, you know, there are now people who have predispositions that make them vulnerable and digital media is helping them find the kinds of content that might exacerbate those predispositions and, um, and, and potentially worsen them. Well, while I have the opportunity, you know, at the opening of, of that, uh, that response, you said that we don't have full visibility into the algorithm, which obviously you don't. Um, as a researcher who's concerned with these issues and trying to understand, uh, understand them, um, you know, what, what should the platforms do to facilitate the kind of public interest research that you want to do? Are there things that uh, the commission could consider recommending to enable better research. Uh, and if you had your, your wish list of things that would make it easier for you to do the kind of analysis and exploration you want to do, what would you want? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's a really difficult one. Um, the privacy and legal concerns here are real. Um, there was an effort called Social Science One um, that tried to provide researcher uh, access to Facebook data but the privacy barriers that were created were uh, quite severe, right? Because it's important, it, it genuinely is important to protect user privacy um, among people who haven't opted into participating in research. Um, my um, instinct is that future research partnerships between academics, outside academics who are at arm's length, who are not paid by the platforms and the platforms themselves are a way to provide credible third-party evaluations. We can't just make this data public. It's just mm -hmm. too sensitive, but there are ways with appropriate protections to allow researcher access that preserves their independence while also preserving protections for the data that's involved. And the platforms need to be encouraged to engage in those kinds of partnerships. Um, and importantly, they, that needs to be a, a, what we would call an incentive compatible choice. In other words, when they engage in those partnerships, um, it's important to see that as being entered in good faith if that's in fact what the platforms do instead of them up for whatever findings uh, result, or they will close up and we'll never hear from them again. Um, so if, if those kinds of partnerships are a PR liability, um, they will go away. And I should say by way of full disclosure that I'm one of the academics involved in such a partnership with Facebook examining its, um, uh, its effects during the 2020 election. That research is in progress, so I can't comment on it now, but it provides a potential model for the commission to uh, consider. And um, one that I hope um, you know, YouTube and Twitter and other platforms could build on. That's a great um, segue to, I wanna ask you one question that relates to the, the last two US elections, and then we'll have a, a wrap up question. I wanna invite you to give any advice to the commission you might want to. Um, but on the election, the NBC interviewed you on the topic of fake news. 
in the 2016 U.S. election, and you said, in response to a question about the role of the media in spreading false information, quote, people got vastly more misinformation from Donald Trump than they did from the fake news websites, full stop. Now, in the 2020 election, one of my colleagues at a major social media platform said to me, uh, you don't need foreign actors when the calls are coming from inside the White House. Um, so today, Trump has lost all of his platforms, um, both the White House, but also uh, his social media platforms. Do you think that's changed the equation? And considering your earlier comments about different ways to impact elites, was deplatforming the right approach or were there other tactics that you think also could have been successful? That's a hard question. Um, so let me start with your first point. I do think it's, um, I, I just wanna, I, I wanna reiterate the importance of elite misinformation um, as, a, as a source of, uh, of misinformation and, and, and the dilemmas it creates. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's often a demand for the platforms to take actions that are ultimately either that are illiberal, infeasible, or both. And I would strongly encourage everyone interested in this space and the commission itself to reflect very carefully on those choices. I don't think we should demand that the platforms become the global speech police. I think, in fact, I think we should be incredibly uncomfortable with empowering any company to mm -hmm exercise influence over human speech on that scale. Now, some will say they already are doing so, but of course that could be far more draconian than the current practices of the platforms. Um, I, I, I think we should be careful what we wish for there. Um, and, and, and that includes in particular, removing political leaders who people have every right to expect to hear from in whatever way they choose to communicate with the people who are responsible for electing them and to whom they're accountable. Um, so I think deplatforming elected leaders is a step one should take with great care and trepidation. Um, in the Trump case, um, he had just inspired a violent insurrection um, that threatened the certification of the results of the election. I don't think the platforms had any other choice um, and I have no objections to that um, action but it should be very much the exception rather than the rule. Um, we don't want politicians' ability to speak to the public to be subject to negotiation with platform companies on a daily basis, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's giving them a tremendous amount of power. I think that's something we should be really uncomfortable with. Um, and again, the point you made about the call coming from inside the house is critical here. There is a social consensus that Russian trolls have no legitimate place in our political discourse. Mm -hmm. And so we're perfectly comfortable with the platform companies removing them at scale. We're perfectly comfortable, appropriately, of course, with the platform companies um, you know, trying to stop uh, you know, corporate influence campaigns that misrepresent the identities of the people speaking or people who engage in child sexual abuse, right? All of that, there's a social consensus that should be removed, right? Mm -hmm. It's much harder when it comes to people in domestic politics, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's just, no, there's just no easy answer there. Um, and I guess um, I, I would be suspicious of anyone who tells you there is. Um, the final point I'll add is that scale is a huge and often um, neglected factor in this conversation, Facebook scale just changed the nature of that decision um, because it is so vast. Um, the number of users it has is, is so great, um, especially when you include Instagram and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, no one's particularly worried about whether Snapchat deplatformed Donald Trump, right? I don't even know if they did. Um, I don't even know if he had an account, right? Um, Facebook scale enables it to do things other platforms can't. It can employ literally tens of thousands of people to moderate content around the world. But it also means that when they get things wrong, they get things wrong at world historical scale. And the stakes mm -hmm. are really high. Yeah. This brings me to my last question. Um, so as I, I said in the opening, you know, these conversations are meant to inform both the public, but also to serve as a, a benefit to the members of our commission who are exploring all of these issues in, in depth as they're right now in this first phase of work setting their priorities and the scope of those priorities. 
And so I want to invite you at this point to, to offer any advice if there are particular areas that you think the commission should focus their attention on when developing recommendations for the short or the long term. And is there anything you think they should not focus on uh, mm -hmm. and that is not worth their, their energy? And I want to give you that opportunity. Um, well, I would... I once got some very sage advice when working on a report of this kind, um, and this is a bit of a dated reference, but maybe some of the commission members are old enough to remember it. Um, basically, to imagine most reports as ending up uh, like the warehouse at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, where it, it's, you know, that's where most reports end up. Um, and I would encourage the commission to think about how it can avoid that fate. Um, and I would suggest that being um, specific and actionable is going to be important. And I would encourage them to read the many, 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 many reports that came out after 2016. I went to conference after conference on this, on topics like this in that period. Mm -hmm. And um, basically figure out how they can say something that is both new and actionable relative to those kinds of reports. Um, I think, um, I would also consider them, uh, encourage them to think about who will listen to them and who their networks are most relevant to reaching. They may have actually, like, so uh, as an example, uh, I was part of an ad hoc commission that Rick Hassan at UC Irvine organized um, uh, about how to cover the 2020 election. And he did an incredible job of focusing us on actionable recommendations that media organizations could put into practice to protect the integrity of that election and make sure that it was covered in a way that made the, create the best incentives possible um, for the political actors who might try to um, overturn the results. Um, the commission seems to have lots of people with, with media connections. They need to think about how 2022 and 2024 are going to be covered and how they could encourage a journalistic response that's, that meets the moment. Uh, when we have an ex-president who continues to reject the legitimacy of an election and who is campaigning to win over his party to take up that fight. Um, mm -hmm. That's an area where there is yet no consensus on how to proceed and the commission could intervene in a powerful way. Um, encouraging, and I'll, I'll add two more, encouraging, as we talked about, tech companies to cooperate with outside researchers and to provide more forms of external accountability, like, ex like externally reported metrics that have some sort of an auditing mechanism that's credible. Um, YouTube has experimented with something like this recently. There's a lot more to do. The Facebook election research model is another one that could be um, adopted. Um, again, because of their positioning, they could potentially reach the kinds of executives of the tech companies who might be able to unlock those partnerships. Hmm. Um, uh, I'm forgetting the third one. Anything you, that they should not focus on, I guess, was my uh, my other piece. But perhaps you've answered it by implication. Um, I think they should not try to. Um, I would encourage them to avoid vague bromides about how polarization is bad, hmm. um, because uh, polarization is going to be the background condition of our politics for the rest of my and your life in all likelihood. Um, the period of the mid 20th century that um, we use as a reference point when we think about the norms of our political system was a historical anomaly. Um, it was the lowest period of partisan polarization in the history of the United States as far as our records indicate. Um, it's not coming back. And not only that, it only existed because the ugly history of race in this country had internally divided the Democratic Party in a way that severed the linkage between party and ideology and led to a group of conservative Democrats existing in the South that function as a kind of centrist bloc. That world is not, as far as we can tell, coming back anytime mm -hmm. soon. Um, we need to think about how our political system can thrive under conditions of polarization. And one of the ways to do that is to address the ha most harmful consequences of misinformation. But it's not going to go away. And decrying it won't accomplish very much either. <laughs>
Um, the other recommendation I have is to avoid faulting or condemning people for being human beings. I think the people who believe in spread misinformation are much more often the victim um, here. They've been misled and they've been let down by a political and media system that's given them bad information and bad incentives mm -hmm. and, um, and put them into an ecosystem that doesn't allow them to form accurate beliefs. And they're never gonna be perfect. They're human beings, they have other priorities. Um, but we need to think about um, how we can serve them better instead of castigating them for acting like the human beings we all are. Well, that's a perfect and compassionate uh, place to end. Brendan, thank you very much for the conversation today. I appreciate all your work and your insights and, and thanks for speaking with me. My pleasure.